Um, so the first thing I wanted to mention, and I won't try and demo it because we've not really got the bandwidth, is um, Heroku recently put out, it's in beta at the moment, but this is and will be an officially supported Ember build pack for the Heroku platform. So this means that you can have, you can hook up your Heroku pipeline to your Ember CLI powered project. And when your CI passes, Heroku will pull in, pull in the latest code base, perform the build for you, put it on the right dyno, all the rest of it you can make. And so I think what it does, it's, um, it's composed of three build packs, one of which is a no build pack, and then the Ember CLI build pack, which, which does a bit more, has a bit more intelligence around Ember apps. And then Heroku build pack static by Terence Lee is um, basically stands up Nginx on a dyno to serve the static assets. Um, I've tried this, I've been trying this a lot at work and it's, it's works wonderfully for review apps. So when your team make a pull request to your Ember CLI application, Heroku will notice that automatically, stand it up on a temporary subdomain. Everyone can review what's going on with it. Um, it's pretty fast because, because Heroku is able to uh, cache basically the node modules and bower components directories between builds. Each build winds up taking around 15 seconds, 30 seconds, that kind of thing, depending on the size of your project. Um, really powerful stuff. Keep your eyes on this um, for EmberConf next month. And um, keep eyes on Heroku and Fastboot as well. I hear there's stuff going on there. So <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, the second thing, has anyone ever used an animation library called Greensock? I know it once. Yeah. OK, so it's an old animation library. It comes from the Flash days. And it got ported to JavaScript, and it's still alive and kicking. I remember in the start of my career, I was, yeah. Um, so let's, uh, I've not really, no. I think Velocity, the, the, their main target was Greensock, right? They were trying to bring an open source equivalent, and, and then Google brought the guy who basically created it into Google, and I think that's kind of Velocity, has lost its Velocity. Oh, really? They hired you, they hired you? I think so. Oh. Yeah. So what I want to show, we'll see how long it takes me to do it. It's not really about Greensock specifically, it's more about interoperating with libraries like it. And I think the same things apply to D3 and to things like the Ace Editor. But what I wanted to try and do was, um, let's make a new route. Um, let's call this demo. And eventually, let's pump the font size a bit. And let's make a new component. I'm going to call it cool component. Okay. Let me just remove that button from my uh, main layout there. And let's use cool component in here. Okay, so Okay, so let's try and think of a simple application of this. Um, uh, what I want to do basically is animate in some shapes on a green sock timeline, but then allow Ember to control that timeline. And this is something I've been been playing with at work. It was a client requirement that we use Greensock, and it just impressed me how straightforward it was. And do you know, I mean, so in terms of licensing, though, what does that actually mean I mean, in terms of restrictions? Um, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, they gave a compiled version, 
which you are allowed to use in certain projects, but not really commercial ones unless you buy a license from them and yeah. you come up with something and you can install them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Runspire from Chicago, he's uh, building um, a uh, green sock version of um, smoking. Oh, green. So that's another thing about, about this. I've been using, I've, I've spent this week using green sock with liquid fire, and interop is absolutely fine. It means that you end up not using the uh, animate stop is animating helper functions that uh, liquid fire provides. <laughs> but it's, um, broadly speaking, no problem at all. So let's make these, uh, say, in my box. I uh, wasn't doing anything heavy enough really to notice. Uh, maybe on mobile it would have shown up, but... Alright, so let's say we want these to drop in one after the other. So I'm going to import... Um, let's go for the, the one thing that... Using Greensock really reminds me of the flash days, I've got to say. <laughs> uh, it's not terrifically well packaged for importing into Ember, but Runspired, Chris Thoburn has created an add-on to allow you to use it. So um, I want this to come in, let's say, on did insert element, let's make a timeline, and let's get hold of um, those objects in here, these uh, rectangles I've made. And I, it, it really frustrates me to have to switch to each rather than for each when working with the jQuery object. So I'll turn it into an array first. And we'll say um, timeline. So uh, Greensock has two things. It has tweens, which should be familiar to everyone, and timeline, which is a way of scheduling a load of tweens in. And once you've got a timeline, you can schedule other timelines into it as well. Once you've got a timeline, you have complete control over its playhead. So let's say obj, and this is the duration of this transition. Let's make it a little quicker. And let's transform it from, uh, let's say just minus 300 pixels. To that. Okay, so there's there's a very simple animation. Um, it's got the ability to schedule exactly into um, to determine exactly where in the timeline this thing comes. I'm gonna say uh, it'll be a quarter second before the previous one's finished, if you see what I mean? So it's slightly more staggered. Anyway, this isn't the point necessarily. <laughs> the point is how to hook this up to, to Ember. So let's make a button. And when I click that button, in fact, I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's say this timeline is paused to begin with, paused at the outset. And I'm just going to actually make the timeline available. That will probably punish me for re-renders or for um, triggering a re-render. So let's make timeline. Or do we do it on init, maybe? Yeah, could do it on init, but then the, um, the DOM won't be available at that point. So let's say, um, let's say timeline is um, computed property that just returns a new timeline and caches it. And now we can, now we will have a stable timeline instance around and that seems better. Okay, so on click of this button, oops. I was really hoping with closure actions, I'd be able to do something like, like that. But unfortunately you can't, the scoping doesn't work quite as you'd expect it to. Uh, this dot get whoop. so let's see how that's all worked out 
to på det der, ja. Do you not need the uh, actions hash anymore? It depends. Depends how you address the action. So if you address it like that, a named action, it will look it up in the actions hash. If you address it like that, it's it's just going to find the property. Um, And then call the uh, action on it. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. It does a function. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do prefer it makes sense, right? Like, I do prefer to have it in the action. Define anonymity or. Otherwise, why do we have the action? Who can see what I've I've done wrong here? Let's see what what thing here is. Uh, component default. I would have expected that to work. Let's see. I was wondering. But then again, there is no this for it to have to deal with. I'm surprised about that. Well, in that case, I'm going to do what was suggested. Not waste any time. That's that. That's a good warning. Take heed, everybody. That's new, I guess. Yeah, it does seem new. Ooh. Okay, cool. So I've got play. Let's add in a pause button. It's probably a little too quick for me to work with at this point. So let's make this thing a little bit slower. And. Uh, let's have a um, reverse. That will complain because there's no, there's actually nothing for it to talk to. Okay. Um, Now it'd be it'd be nice to have a slider. Um, so this is going to let's see. We'll bind it to something I'm going to call progress, which is what GreenSock. GreenSock. It's a, a number between naught and one as to how far along the timeline you are. Um, we'll define that computer property in a second. Um, min is zero. Max is one. Step. We'll we'll say is um, actually. I don't know if you can. Say a fairly small increment, Oop. and on input we will mute progress. Oops. Okay, so that's saying when the on input event uh, is triggered. We're creating a closure action. We are creating a mutation function around this progress property. And we're going to pluck target.value off of the event, which will be whatever the value currently is of this, this uh, progress input. Uh, I'm going to create a progress computed function. Now, hopefully, let's just see. I'm going to, just in case it's the import that's messed things up, Um, this doesn't really depend upon anything. I mean, t technically, it depends upon the timeline, but we won't worry about that for now. So to get this, what we're returning is this dot get timeline dot progress. In GreenSock, the getters and setters tend tend to be this way. A function with no arguments gets the value. A function with arguments sets it. I do not expect this to work first time, but we'll see. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, so the thing I need to do in order to fully wire this up, it wouldn't just work automatically, is um, this timeline. Let's just break this out a little bit. 
needs to tell our, comp our wrapping component when things are changing. So there is... You got a typo. Where's my typo? No, oh, Tim Line. I've typed that about 300 times this week. <laughs> uh, so on update, we're just going to notify um, property, property change of progress. And in fact, let's just, mm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna attempt fate with that. You maybe saw a little bit of a glitch there. I'm not quite sure what that is. I think it's a rounding thing. So this input is trying to adhere correctly to its steps. You'll notice also that it's still, it's still busy playing. So you, you, it's trying to fight you as you drag it, but that's really easy to fix. Um, action, pause. So I found the same thing with D3. It's not that you need to like create an element and then just go, right, D3, you do what you want with that, and I'll just trust that you're going to do the right thing. With these third-party libraries, you can always hook into HTML bars really nicely. With D3, it works great, because with D3, you could effectively take one of their layout functions, take the raw values that it produces, and plug them into your HTML bars templates. And then you've got this direct declarative correspondence between the data you're producing and where it's wired into the DOM. You know, you can, you can see exactly the DOM you'll be getting, effectively. So, um, GreenSock is a nice library. I love the fact that it's survived since the ActionScript days, and I love even more how easy it is <coughs> to plug it into Ember. Uh, any questions about all of that? I would suggest um, now conferences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Ember Conf two thousand fifteen. There is an absolutely wonderful talk from I this. Remember, was a young kid. Uh, younger guy, yeah, Chris Hen. Dynamic graphic composition with Ember. Yeah. Um, off the back of this talk, he ended up working with Tilda for a while, and um, this is this is just perfect. This is like Miguel level of component composition. So uh, yeah, check this one out. This is really great. Well, I don't, maybe we should talk about D3, but apparently there, it's going to go through a major release, in which is going to make it a lot more modern in the way that people innovate. It's supposed to be a pretty significant. Oh, really? I don't know that. It's meant to work with SPAs more and so on and so forth. Sounds good. I mean, I think with D3, all of the functions it's composed of, all of the, the different built-ins, you can always pluck them out fairly easily. And you know, if what you want to do is interpolating between one scale and another, there's a function for that. You can just use that on its own. If it's a certain um, you know, type of, uh, what are they called, chloroplast? chloroplath layout or whatever it is that you're after, there's always the function standing by itself, feed it some data, get some new data back, and you can plug that in. Yeah. And especially now in the glimmer days where we can have maximal DOM reuse, um, it's, it's, a, it's a really nice integration. OK, so uh, pub time. I just had a, uh, I remember something anyone should know. Did you go <laughs> This thing, binding value of an input and using an input to update the value, is something that used to not uh, used to fail with regular inputs because you lose the personal position when you update the value. Uh, Ember JS, if you go to pull request, can you say Ember? A pull, cr a pull request by Martin, right? Yes. Um. 
Oh, here we go, yeah. The thing is, now there is really no reason to use the input helper anymore. I mean, the, the uh, angle brackets and the brackets input. This happens to be around 40 to 60 times faster and consume like 20% of the memory. So don't use the other one. There's no, no reason. But unless you want to hook into the into when this thing is added and make perhaps a, an input text area out to browse or something like that, that's something you cannot do with the uh, a raw HTML input. And it's interesting. It's it's a relatively small change. Yes. When you look at it, before setting the value of an input, you check if the value of the input is already the same thing, and if you if the same thing, you do nothing. So that prevents you to lose the cursor position because you are setting the value to something that's already there. Yeah, so curly inputs are a thing of the past. OK, let me, uh, one last bit of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>